Welcome to the meeting, and we are now ready for the first lecture, which will be given by Professor Toshi Koseki from Tokyo University of Technology. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Toshi Koseki from the uh, University of Tokyo, Japan. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Hari Badesha for organizing this wonderful conference and uh, for including me here. And uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues uh, here, actually Nambu is over there, uh, who, who, who have contributed to the research that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Architecture of Steel. This name was given by Hari. Uh, when I gave a talk somewhere else on uh, our multi-layer steel, uh, because I like the name, so I, I use the name again here. So uh, all of us here uh, know that uh, uh, many different kinds of steels were developed in the 20th century, and uh, the, they, the performance and the properties of the steel were significantly improved over the century. Uh, those uh, uh, development that advanced advancement, uh, certainly thanks to a, a theoretical basis that was also developed in the 20th century and also achieved by uh, alloy design with a different combination of uh, rare, rare metals and also achieved by uh, uh, microstructure control by uh, some mechanical process and also by uh, uh, high purification. Also, uh, we have used uh, fully the strengthening mechanism to develop uh, different steels. So, Looks like uh, uh, to improve the steel, we have done almost everything. But still, the demand, uh, still the demand for high-performance steel is never ending. And with increasing the environment consciousness, uh, the demand becomes stronger and stronger. For example, if we look at the automobile steels, uh, higher strengths and the higher ductilities are uh, demanded. And uh, so we need to meet the demand. We have to go this direction. How, how can we do that? We may need a uh, new alloy design, and we may need a new uh, micro and nano microstructure control uh, that we, have, we haven't tried in the 20th century. And also, we may need the ultimate refinement of microstructure and the grain uh, structures. Alternatively, uh, we may need uh, externally architectural steel, or uh, externally uh, designed steel, where we can get away from uh, monolithic steel, and uh, we can part from the thermodynamic restriction in the design of material, in the design of steel. So this is my proposal here. Uh, today, uh, I'm talking about uh, externally designed multi-layer steel. This is an example of our multi-layer steels, where we combine uh, uh, high strength uh, as quenched mountain site and uh, high ductility steel and, uh, to, to achieve uh, a combination of high strength and high ductilities. And uh, although this is a 25-layer steel, the number of layers could be fewer, uh, depending on the combination of steels, as I will, I will mention later. To fabricate uh, multi-layer steels, we stack the steel of our interest and then uh, uh, hot rolled or warm rolled or even cold rolled for bonding. And finally, uh, we heat treated to, to achieve a microstructure, desired microstructure and to increase the interfacial toughness. And for the high strength layers, we use the as quenched mountain site. Right? And for high ductility layers, we use uh, austenitic steel, or so ferritic steel, or trip steel, or dual phase steel, so whatever steel that has the ductility. In other words, you, you can combine any steels of your interest. And sometimes we insert uh, thin nickel layers to prevent uh, carbon diffusion between the layers. Why the layer structure? Uh, to achieve the high elongation, uh, we need to elongate the mountain side, unquenched mountain side. In a du dual phase steels, mountain side is not deformed because the stress is not partitioned to the mountain side. And uh, there is a stress concentration 
in a ferrite matrix, uh, particularly between a mountainside island, which result in a voiding and eventually a fracture. In case of layered structure, stress is partitioned uh, both the uh, ductile layer and uh, high strength layer. So uh, with the plastic constraint, uh, the mountainside should be elongated as long as the uh, local fracture is suppressed, which is not easy. These are the data of uh, strength and the ductility of uh, laminated metals, uh, different uh, laminated metals, which was uh, uh, summarized by uh, Ludwig and uh, Sharby. And the uh, strength is, uh, always follows the rule of uh, mixture, rule of average uh, along this line. But the ductility is not, does not follow the rule of mixture. This vertical axis is the elongation of the laminated metals consisting of 50% uh, ductile and 50% uh, uh, brittle uh, component. And uh, this elongation come down here, far below the uh, rule of average, as the elongation of the brittle component uh, becomes uh, low. What, why uh, do we have such low elongation? Uh, because uh, we have a brittle uh, fracture uh, during elongation in the brittle layer, as shown here, which is caused by delamination and, H and the resulting H-shaped cracks, and also uh, so-called tunnel cracks. We have to suppress those uh, local fractures uh, to obtain a larger elongation. In terms of uh, delamination and H-shaped cracks, uh, naturally uh, increasing interfacial toughness uh, increases the uh, uh, elongation of multi-layer steel. And when, when the there is a delamination, a uh, brittle layer behaves like a single component. And without the uh, uh, plastic constraint, uh, it, it breaks, uh, it fractures at, uh, uh, with a low elongation like here. And if the interfacial toughness is not enough, the elongation is still below the uh, uniform elongation predicted by a rule of mixture. And uh, with increasing interfacial toughness, uh, the multilayer steels are fractured with uh, diffuse necking in a uh, uh, ductile manner. This boundary can be predicted uh, by this equation, which, which was also developed in the research of composite. And uh, the, this criterion is given by this line. Looks like a, a, this, this criterion works well. For the prevention of a, a tunnel crack, uh, there is also work about the tunnel crack in the research of semiconductors, which is given here, where the, the, the thickness of a brittle layer is limited, uh, which is a function of a fracture toughness of brittle layers. So uh, you need to reduce the thickness of brittle layer to to avoid the uh, tunnel crack. But uh, this criterion was derived in an uh, elastic situation. In case of metals, you have a plastic zone in a ductile layers uh, in the vicinity of a tunnel crack. We have to consider that. So considering the uh, elastic plastic situation, we derived this criterion. Uh, again, the, the thickness of brittle layer should be reduced to increase the elongation, which is a function of fracture toughness of a brittle layer and the yield strength of ductile layers. Certainly, the decrease of the layer thickness increases the elongation of unquenched mountainside. By, by decreasing the thickness of mountainside, uh, uh, this uh, type 420 uh, high carbon uh, mountain silic stainless steel can be elongated up to near uh, 20%. So uh, without uh, multi-layer structure, we can't elongate the unquenched mountainside in this way. Also, the fracture, uh, fracture surface changes from uh, brittle to uh, ductile dimpling uh, as, as the thickness of uh, mountainside layer is decreased. This is the effect of uh, thickness of brittle layer on the elongation. And these two lines are from the elastic model and the elastoplastic models. And uh, 
When you use uh, austenitic uh, type 3 or 4 stainless steel for ductile layers, because the type 3 of stainless steel has a good uh, work hardening, the transition from low elongation to the high elongation is close to the elastic model. And when you use uh, uh, ferrite, interstitial free ferrite as a ductile layer, because uh, this steel does not show much uh, uh, work hardening, so the transition behavior from uh, low elongation to the high elongation is close to the elastoplastic model. So the transition in a multi-layer steel, transition from low uh, elongation to the high elongation is somewhere in between. And the, the elastoplastic model we developed uh, gives the lower boundary in the design of multi-layer steel. And also, the limitation of the uh, brittle layer uh, is a function of fracture toughness. So uh, these are confirmed here. We provided a mountain silic steel having a different uh, fracture toughness and uh, measure the transition. And certainly, increasing a fracture toughness uh, gives the thicker uh, brittle layers. In other words, uh, uh, you can increase the thickness of brittle layer if you have uh, uh, mountain silic steel with a better toughness, or you, you can reduce the number of layers. So by controlling interface of toughness and uh, controlling the thickness of brittle layers, we can now elongate the unquenched mountain site. And if you apply in a, a neutron diffraction, uh, this is the result. Uh, you will measure the fully partitioning of stress. And uh, because of partitioning of stress, mountain site is uh, being elongated here. And uh, as a result, we obtain a steels uh, which have a high strength and a high ductility. Those uh, plotted here, those steels have uh, strengths are more than 1,200 megapascal, and they still have an uh, elongation of 20, more than 20 percent. And uh, the product of uh, strength and elongation is uh, more than the double of uh, a conventional uh, monolithic steels. This multi-layer steels uh, keep the uh, elongation even under the high strain rate uh, deformation. Uh, here the stress strain curves of a uh, and the different strain rate, and uh, the maximum is 800 per second. And uh, uh, yield strength increases with increasing a uh, strain rate, but the uh, elongation does not change much. And those photos uh, are the test result of high-speed buckling, uh, which simulate the uh, collision of uh, front side member of automobiles. And uh, the 1200 megapascal multilayer steel uh, deforms perfectly uh, in the same way as the 590 uh, dual phase steels. And uh, still there is a space for additional deformation because of the high strength. And uh, I'd like to note there is no delamination or a local crack uh, during this uh, high strain rate deformation. Here's another high strain rate uh, deformation. Uh, this is an impact bending test, uh, which simulates uh, uh, pillars of automobiles. And uh, the bending strength is increased in the uh, multi-layer steel. So here's a uh, DP590 for comparison. And uh, significantly, the bending uh, strength is increased here. And uh, in the application of multi-layer steel, we need a welding. So uh, we are trying uh, to weld the multi-layer steel uh, using a friction stir welding. And uh, this is a cross-section. And uh, the Welding is successful, uh, which, which have a, uh, joint efficiency more than 90%. And uh, it is interesting to note uh, here, <coughs> this layer structure is still remain, not only in a heat affected zone, but also in a steel zone. Uh, by using a multi-layer steel, uh, now we can look at the deformation behavior of a quenched mountain site, which, uh, which was difficult before because of the low ductility of as quenched mountain site. And uh, we are now conducting uh, many in situ observations on the uh, deformation of as quenched mountain site <laughs> and uh, using an EBS pin. Uh, here's a, a multi-layer of steels, and uh, this is the monolithic mountain, mountain silic steels. And we found the slip is always uh, along the uh, in, in plane, uh, in that plane, 
and uh, uh, at the, up to the certain strain levels. And beyond that, uh, the slips across the, across the uh, last, last direction uh, start to appear. And uh, this slip is concentrated in the region uh, where the uh, Schmidt factor along the in, in that plane is high. And uh, no slips in those regions uh, where the uh, Schmidt factor is low. This is a similar result uh, using a digital image correlation using a, a silver nanoparticle during a tensile test. Again, the uh, stress concentration is in a block, mountain side block, uh, where the Schmidt factor along the in last plane uh, is high, and the other part is not deformed uh, significantly, even though the Schmidt factor is high, which is uh, out of last plane. And uh, the Schmidt factor along the in last plane is low, because, because this is low. So further improvement of the uh, multi-layer skills, uh, we need to improve the process. We are now looking at the lower temperature, lower pressure bonding, which makes the fabrication much easier and more efficient. And in terms of a component, uh, not only use the high carbon martensitic steels, we are now using uh, uh, HTP metals such as the magnesium and the titanium to achieve a lighter uh, multi-layer steels. And uh, we are now using a steel with uh, high impurities, like a scrap steel, so that we can use a scrap to fabricate the high performance steels. Here's an example of a magnesium steel multi-layer. Uh, we have developed a good uh, uh, bonding a process to join the magnesium and the steel, and we fabricate the a three layer magnesium steel multi layer. And um, magnesium is a commercially available uh, lightest metal. And, uh, but the problem is the ductility. Because of H HCP structures, the elongation is uh, up to 20% or, or even less. But uh, by employing multi layer structure, we can, we can increase the ductility of magnesium without any break, and uh, up to a 35 to 40 percent. And the strength is also increased because of steels. So this is, uh, this is the summary of my talk, and this is all my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so I was wondering how you deal with the uh, um, differential volume contractions and expansions that you get when you quench the multi-layers, because obviously you're going to get different volume expansions with the Martin site transformation. And does that set up like residual stresses between the layers that might result in like crack propagation being easier and delamination becoming easier? How do you deal with that? Yeah, you're right. Uh, there must be uh, some residual stress and. Uh, uh, we are now measuring how much residual stress and uh, uh, what the effect on the uh, mechanical properties. And uh, yeah, certainly there is uh, some residual stress. You're saying that decrease in martensite layer thickness is increasing the toughness. Is it not yeah. due to uh, locally plane strain loading condition is uh, starting in those only the martensitic uh, layer only? Well, uh, you're right. Uh, as, as the thickness decreases, uh, situation comes to that. But uh, uh, the thickness can be uh, thicker if the, if the fracture toughness of mountain side is, uh, uh, is maybe medium or not high. But uh, uh, the, today I showed the mountain side, uh, uh, is, uh, which is a type 420 uh, high carbon. Uh, mountain acidic stainless steel. This is really brittle. The fracture toughness is really low. But the, uh, the normal uh, carbon steel, uh, the mountain side of carbon, carbon steel is, is, is not so such low. So we can increase more. So the situation is not, is not simply a plain. But, uh, um, so far, you've made these materials by starting with the original layers and then rolling them together, is that, is that right? Right. Have you looked at other methods of fabricating this kind of structure? I mean, additive layer manufacturing looks like it would be well suited to a layered structure like that with electron beam or laser. 
ah. depositing powder and then just obviously <laughs> got a lot of flexibility to pick whatever material or thickness you want there. Well, multi-layer structure mm -hmm. uh, is employed everywhere, like uh, in a semiconductor. In that case, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, they deposit layer by layer. But this is a structure still, we need a volume. So the easier and the simple fabrication is better. So mm -hmm. at the moment, uh, we, we thought of many possibilities, but at the moment, I think this is the simplest way. Okay, what sort of thickness are you aiming to get? Excuse me? What's, you say it's easy to get like good bulk volume material. What sort of thickness and volumes are you interested in fabricating? Um, in, in our case, the thickness, uh, anyway, this is sheet material. Yes. Uh -huh. So the uh, thickness is about uh, 0.5 to 2 millimeter or something like that. The final thickness. Okay, but a sheet quite wide, I guess. All right. Yeah, okay. yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, in, in our research, uh, we already made uh, 60 meter steels, okay. coil to coil. Uh, so when you do the hot rhodium, warm rhodium of mountain side multi-layer, so the mountain side phase actually during rolling is changed back to oxygenite or is it mountain side? In hot rolling and warm rolling. Could, could you repeat again? So when you do hot rolling or warm rolling of your multi-layer mm -hmm. steel, so one layer suppose is a mountain side. So the mountain side in that temperature has actually changed back to austenite or? Oh, I understand. Uh, during uh, fabrication, mountain steel uh, steels does not have the microstructure of mountain site. Uh, it's uh, uh, like a mixture of uh, uh, ferrite and the cementite or something. During a hot rolling. Uh, and after, after that, uh, the, the heat treatment is made. And uh, after the austenite region and the quenched, so, where the mountain site is formed. Uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. It reminds me of the uh, fiber metal laminate work that was done uh, a few years ago, uh, introducing polymers and uh, metal layers together. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you'd um, done any corrosion studies um, introducing uh, dissimilar metals, often problematic. That's also a good question. Uh, we haven't done a corrosion test. Uh, there is a uh, possibility that the corrosion uh, resistance is decreased if you combine the, like a magnesium. Uh, did you measure the transmogeneous of the machinery materials? Yes, uh, but uh, at the moment we combine steel to steel. So Young's modulus is the same. Uh, yes, it means uh, just follow the mixture rules. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Just uh, this mixture. is well known, yes. Okay. I was wondering if you did fatigue testing and um, stress localization testing for formability. Uh, we, are, uh, we are conducting a fatigue test too. And uh, uh, at, at the moment, uh, uh, there's nothing I can say about that. Uh, uh, there certainly, uh, the multi-layer still affects the uh, fatigue behavior. Did you um, make uh, stress localization uh, experiments to understand the viscoplastic behavior under forming or for forming? Um, at the moment, uh, we haven't done much of that. Thank you. In a 3D deformation. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, but could you explain me in a few words what is the difference between your idea of uh, uh, composite material on the base of steel with, uh, uh, for example, the Mahagana steel or um, Damascus steel. It seems ah. to me that it is the same <laughs> idea. Yes, maybe the uh, origin is the same. Uh, in the past, many people uh, studied the multi-layer metals, uh, even at Damascus too. But uh, uh, in the past, it uh, uh, looks like uh, uh, the less attention uh, was paid to the ductility. And the people tried to increase the strength, but uh, uh, the research on the ductility uh, is limited as far as we uh, investigated. Thank you. Yes, during the treatment, uh, do you study the, uh, how important is the diffusion, for example, of carbon between the thin layers mm. of high or low carbon? Mm. 
still yes, uh, it is very important to suppress the diffusion of carbon. And uh, uh, when we uh, combine the different skills, we always think about the uh, activity of carbon during a heat treatment. So that uh, maybe alloy design is needed to suppress the diffusion of carbon for uh, brittle layer and ductile layers. Toshi, how do you measure the interfacial strength? Uh, we, we use a peel test. But uh, we can't measure uh, if the interfacial strength is really high. Right. Just uh, only a brittle interface can be measured. And how do you control it? Um, Nambu, can you, can you explain that? Uh, in, the, in the case of the weak inter interfacial toughness, the uh, morphology of the the test is uh, the tensor direction is just uh, one, uh, 180 degrees. So the the morphology and the, the uh, stress stress direction is almost constant. So we can evaluate the difference. In the but supposing that uh, the interfacial strength is uh, too low, yeah, how can I change it? You know that. Yeah, uh, of course. Oh, yeah. it, in, the, mm. in the case of very, very, very weak <laughs> interface toughness, it is very difficult to evaluate. But uh, in, in the case of the uh, arterial, for example, on uh, uh, 500 degrees C or 600 degrees C, uh, we can evaluate the uh, interface toughness. So the interface toughness uh, is increased by a, by a bonding process and heat treatment. So you can increase the interface toughness. And, uh, I would like to know uh, the interfacial toughness uh, does not be really high unless you give a, a peel test. So, sort of based on, on I guess, that, um, would, it, would it be possible if you did have quite a high um, stress in the, at the interface to sort of design the ductile phase so that it underwent sort of slight plastic relaxation at the interface? which would sort of provide a bit of work hardening and then you wouldn't have the... I mean, would that be beneficial in a way to sort of reduce any stresses that you might get generated in the, in the alloy? Would that be feasible? Or would the work hardening um, limit your, your layer thickness and the, the sort of further work hardening um, capability of it? Um, would that then have an adverse effect on ductility, do you think? Excuse me, could, could, could you repeat that? Oh, so... Um, with the residual stresses that are set up oh, yeah. in the interface, if they were reasonably high, would it be feasible to design your ductile layer to have a yield strength such mm. that mm. it undergoes slight plastic deformation to uh, relieve the residual stresses? And would that work hardening then have an adverse effect on the ductility mm. as mm. a result? Mm. Well, up to now, we haven't. Uh, found any adverse effect on that? Uh, yes, uh, let me be a bit adventurous here and uh, about uh, a little bit spe speculative as well. Um, perhaps you could decrease the carbon diffusion between layers and perhaps improve um, the cohesion effect if you dealt with, let's say, nano structure steel. Uh, so you would get a strength out of a nanostructure steel layer and keep your soft layer uh, as well. Uh, this is highly speculative, you see? So it seems adequate an audience to, to do that. What are your ideas about that? Uh, you mean the diffusion across the interface? Uh, we are now uh, researching that, and uh, we, we want to minimize the diffu diffusion layers to increase the strength and the ductility for uh, brittle layer and the ductile layer. The diffusion of carbon decreases the uh, strength and the ductility both. So uh, that's why I'm saying uh, low temperature bonding is necessary to improve the, uh, uh, multi -layer, the performance of multi-layer steels. And uh, we have a feeling that uh, uh, the, the bonding of interface is possible at uh, uh, medium or lower temperatures. And uh, we don't need uh, uh, big diffusion to increase the interfacial strength. 
uh, did you look at your interfaces at higher magnification and uh, in general how important is the quality of interfaces for you? So do you have rough interfaces or more kind of intermix? Mm. Uh, we are looking at the interface using a transmission electron microscope and uh, uh, of course there is some uh, small void and uh, uh, some discontinuity and some part uh, continuous. And, uh, the details of the development of the interface uh, need to be researched more. I have a more macroscopic question. Um, you're reducing the thickness of the martensitic layer to increase elongation. Right. Now, this is traditional biphase yeah. philosophy. Um, you're also saying that um, strength is a rule of mixtures. Would you not then expect strength to drop? So you sacrifice strength to increase elongation, which is exactly what happens in any biphase microstructure. Um, well, uh, this, is, this is a combination. So we can't go beyond the rule of a mixture. So uh, there is some compensation. Uh, but uh, we can use uh, higher strength uh, steels, like a very high carbon steels, for, uh, so that we can increase the strength. And, uh, the elongation is always, uh, uh, if we make uh, all the effort, we can achieve the rule of mixture, even for the elongation. Yeah, so, you, 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 so you can increase, uh, let me explain more. So uh, anyway, this is a, the a mixture of uh, high strength layers and the low strength layers, and the uh, mixture of uh, high, high ductility and the low ductility. And we can go this way more by using a higher strength steel. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Tashiv. Excellent talk and excellent discussion.